Welcome to the On The Air podcast, a companion to On The Air magazine, a bi-monthly magazine from ARRL for beginner to intermediate ham radio licensees. I'm your host and the editor of On The Air, Becky Schoenfeld, W1BXY. Every month, the On The Air podcast extends material found in On The Air magazine to help you learn about the many things the ham radio hobby and service has to offer. The On The Air podcast is sponsored by ICOM for the love of ham radio. Welcome to the March 2024 episode. The March-April 2024 issue included a story on the April 2024 Solar Eclipse CUSO party, an on-air event coming up on April 8th, the same day as a total solar eclipse. The Solar Eclipse CUSO party, or SEQP for short, is a great opportunity for hams to contribute data to studies of Earth's ionosphere, the part of our atmosphere that makes radio communications possible. With me today is Dr. Nathaniel Frisell, W2NAF, an associate professor at the University of Scranton's Department of Physics and Electrical Engineering and the lead organizer of HAMSCI, the Ham Radio Science Citizen Investigation, which is organizing the SEQP. Welcome, Nathaniel. Thank you very much, Becky. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks for being here. Um, so we have another solar eclipse QSO party coming up on April 8th. So this is the third one, right? This is the third one, yes. It's very exciting. Great. So, um, so the most recent one was back in October 2023, mm-hmm. and the first one was August 2017. Um, That's great. So what has participation in those been like? Have you, have you, are you getting the kind of turnout uh, that you've wanted? Oh, absolutely. Um, back in 2017, I think we had almost 500 people submit logs. And in 2023, you know, we're still tabulating the data now, but we had about 300 people submit logs for the annular eclipse. And I expect we'll have similar results for April. But what's wonderful is, you know, even whether people submit logs or not, if you're on the air using uh, FT8 or CW or some of these digital modes, uh, we still get your signals through things like the reverse beacon network and PSK reporter. So through there, in 2017, we really had well over 2 million QSOs we were able to look at. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So even mm-hmm. if people aren't specifically participating and, and specifically submitting logs, you're still getting a lot of data? Absolutely, yes. That's wonderful. Um, so, so are you finding things in the data that shows that it's worth it to keep having these events? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think our best result is from 2017 because we had enough time to look at everything, but we were able to very clearly show the eclipse effects in uh, 20 meters, uh, uh, 7 megahertz, uh, 40 meters, 3.5 megahertz, 80 meters, and 160 meters as well. And we were able to take those and we were able to compare them to physics-based models. So these results actually help us to see, are our models working right? Are there differences? Things like that. And in um, during the October eclipse, we have a a sister project called the Grape Personal Space Weather Station project. We could see absolutely beautiful eclipse signatures in that project right away. Wonderful. So um, the information that you're distilling from all this data um, is is there information that. Uh, is helping or will eventually help um, the, you know, just the regular hams who are participating in these events? I certainly hope so. Um, the, I mean, first of all, it's just really neat to see, okay, we actually can see these eclipses in regular ham radio communications. Um, we are in comparing these and learning how to compare these ham radio data points to actual models, I think it's going to help us understand our propagation better. And that could eventually feed back into, you know, changing how we operate or how we understand what we're hearing. Great. I think one of the most, uh, one of the most um, interesting things I found from the 2017 eclipse that kind of surprised me is, you know, if 
I before going into the solar eclipse QSO party in 2017, I would have thought that most of the HF communications would have been refracting off of the F layer. And I would guess a lot of people might think that too. But from actually looking at the uh, data and comparing it with the model, we found out that um, many of the communications, at least on the 14 megahertz band, were happening uh, off of the E region. And oh, so that was a really, yeah, so it, you get these sorts of surprising results that, again, make you think, okay, yeah, just the back of the hand um, information we get as ham radio operators, maybe when you look at things a little bit more closely, maybe it's a little bit different from what you originally thought. Yeah, yeah. 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 Wow, great. Um, so uh, I was wondering, um, I I'm hearing things uh, around the office from the other hams in the office here that um, conditions are, are really perking up. Um, you know, we're a few years into solar cycle 25. Um, are, are there differences that you can see from 2017 to the 2023 results that have any um, bearing on the solar cycle heating up? I think I have to look at the data more closely. We haven't yeah gotten through the 2023 data enough to mm -hmm. really answer that, but I'm sure there will be a difference. Mm -hmm. You know, you're you're absolutely right. The solar cycle, things are starting to heat up. We're seeing higher levels of ionization than before. So that's absolutely going to change. And those will be things that we're trying to compare as we write our papers and look at the observations. Um, another thing that I read is that this eclipse on April 8th is going to be the last one to pass over the contiguous US until 2044. So there's going to be this 20 right. year gap. Um, yeah. What is that 20 year gap going to mean in terms of the research that you're conducting in conjunction with these eclipses? Well, um, I guess there's a few things that will happen with it. First of all, we're going to, it takes some time to look at the eclipse data that we we have had. So we, we've had three really nice eclipses right in a row. So we'll be able to take a few years and really try and dig into what we've learned so far. Um, there are, if we want to continue doing eclipse research, even though there are, there won't be another eclipse over the contiguous United States until 2044, we may be able to look at eclipses in other parts of the world. So there are there are going to be other other eclipses that happen. And I know uh, Christina Collins has particularly taken an interest in some of these ones in faraway places. Uh, and then for me too, a lot of people ask, what are we doing after the eclipse? There's, there's so much to be understood just in our day-to-day -day operating. What happens at dawn and dusk? I, I do a lot of research on traveling ionospheric disturbances that happen every day or are connected to the polar vortex. So I'll probably end up focusing a lot on those different topics. Hmm, wonderful. Wow. Um, so the April 8th event, um, what do people have to do in order to, to get in on this? Um, I understand that it's uh, it's kind of any mode that you want to do. Um, you know, do you do you have to have any kind of special equipment? Can you just get on with your regular station? Absolutely, you can just get on with your regular station. And so, um, in in many ways, it's very similar to field day. You can go to hamside.org slash eclipse and you can find the rule set for the solar eclipse QSO party. And just like field day, there's a set of rules that tells you when the event starts, when it ends, what exchange to make, what modes you can use, how to log. Um, it, it works just like that. And so if you just follow the rules on uh, hamside.org slash eclipse, you'll be able to participate. Cool. And even if someone's a technician, uh, if they are equipped to get on 10 or 6, um, mm -hmm. so it's it's really open to everybody, regardless of license yeah. class. Absolutely. And I guess, you know, now that we are going into the peak of the solar cycle, it's a great time for technicians to take advantage of 10 meters and 6 yeah. meters and, and participate in this. Yeah. Um, so you've participated in this yourself as a ham, not just as a researcher. That's right. Yeah. So uh, what yeah. has that been like? What kind of, of things have you done to, to participate in this? 
Well, when in 2017, I actually traveled to totality. So mm -hmm. I went down to uh, Kentucky and I set up kind of a field day style operation out there, you know, strung a G5 RV up in the trees and had my uh, ICOM uh, 7410 out on the table and I just tried to make QSOs. And uh, while I was there, uh, there were also people who were interested in optical astronomy. So um, they were using like solar telescopes and solar filters to look at things. And we're all trying to do it all at the same time. And boy, we were so excited when uh, totality came and there were no clouds and we actually got to see it. It was amazing. Oh, cool. Yeah. Did you do anything I for uh, 2023? For 2023, yes. So I actually stayed at my home QTH right outside of Scranton, and I held a solar eclipse QSO party at my house. <laughs> so I I invited a, a number of my students who are in the W3 USR club and a number of other faculty members up to my house, and uh, we were running FT8 most of the morning, and uh, at simultaneously we were running one of these grape. Uh, personal space weather station HF Doppler receivers that was listening to WWV. And it was also an amazing experience because it was completely cloudy all day, cloudy, wet, and rainy. You couldn't see the sun at all. Uh, we were in where you're supposed to have partial eclipse, but uh, you couldn't see any of that. However, after the eclipse was over, I was able to flip over to that grape receiver. And I could see a beautiful eclipse curve right in that WWV Doppler shift. And so it, it really showed that even if it's cloudy and even if you're not in the path of totality or annularity, HF radio is a great way to interact with the eclipse. Hmm. Very cool. So, um, so once you've participated in the event, uh, you send in your, you just send in your log, right? That's, that's mm -hmm. how you participate in the science aspect of it. That's right, at least in the data collection, yes. Yeah. Um, and what's wh where do those logs go and what's done with them? And do the, the folks on the receiving end of the logs ever um, interact with the hams who have submitted the logs? Uh, absolutely. So it goes to our scoring committee. And so uh, ham side, we have a lot of volunteers. And so uh, we have a volunteer scoring committee who are working on that right now. Um, and those, we are going to send out um, awards to the top scorers. And we'll, we plan on, I'm hoping we have all the scoring done for at least the annular eclipse by Dayton, because I'll be, you know, talking in the antenna forum and giving other presentations there. So I hope to be able to announce those, those winners there. And we'll also, um, I know in the past, uh, during 2017, I wrote everything up for NCJ and published all of the scores as well. So I hope we'll be able to do the same sort of thing this time as well. Great. Yeah. And then the other thing to say is that, um, you know, HAMSI is the sort of organization where uh, people can come and participate in the analysis afterward. So we have weekly telecons that are open to the public that you can go to hamsi.org and you can, you know, find the links to and you can join. You can, we have a list serve. So you can uh, interact with us in the telecons. You can work on trying to do your own data analysis. We have an annual workshop, which is going to be held in Cleveland at Case Western in about a month or so. And uh, many, you know, people will come do their own analysis, present it as either an oral presentation or a poster and be able to share the, their observations that way as well. Oh, great. So HAMSI is offering ways for HAMS to be citizen scientists even beyond um, just getting on the air in the SEQP. Absolutely. Great. Um, so do you have a plan for uh, being on the air on April 8th? I do. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to be here in Scranton, and which again is not in totality, but uh, we were very fortunate. ARDC, Amateur Radio Digital Communications, awarded us a $200,000 grant to install a brand new station here at Scranton. So uh -huh. I know it's beautiful. We have um, an ICOM 7610, uh, we have an ICOM 7300, an ICOM 9700, and then uh, that we had it all professionally installed going up. We have a 40-foot tower on top of our five-story building with a DX Engineering Skyhawk antenna 
uh, for 10, 15, 20, and then a fan dipole for the low bands. So I'm planning on putting that station on the air, getting our club to participate and try to, you know, make as many QSOs as possible. Fantastic. Yeah. Wow. So, um, so it sounds like you have a plan and you have a, a great station to, to do that with. Um, so if someone has never participated in the SCQP, um, maybe, you know, they've, they've heard about it, they've read the articles in QST for the, the past two, um, maybe they're thinking about it, uh, maybe somebody's a technician and, you know, has, has themselves an antenna for 10 meters and it's like, eh, you know, that might be cool, but, you know, can I really do this? Do you, do you have any advice or encouragement for people who are maybe on the fence? Oh, absolutely. Well, I'd say the number one thing is if you have an antenna and you have a rig and you want to participate, just get on the air. You know, don't don't worry too much about the rules for this. Don't worry too much about um, making sure everything's correct. Just get on the air and have fun. And, you know, part of what we have to do as scientists, you know, this is a big data problem. Not all of the data that we get from the RBN or WhisperNet or PSK reporter is going to be completely accurate. We have to do our job to figure out, you know, what works and what doesn't. So really just get on the air, enjoy the experience, try to have fun. And if you don't have experience getting on the air, you might try to find a local club that, you know, participates in field day or participates in contests and see if you can go go along with someone else who has some of this experience and work with them it's a 10-hour event so you really you know it it will work really nicely if you're able to share that time with other people mm -hmm. and uh, and you can for the 10 hours you can do as much or as little of that as you want that's right one of the nice things um if you even if your log isn't perfect if you are able to get on uh, the website and submit something, uh, you'll get a certificate. And some of the really important information we'd be looking for is, uh, you know, what call sign you were using and what latitude and longitude your station was located at. Because if we don't have that information that you submit to us, we're going to try to pull it off of qrz.com. And that may or may not be accurate. But if you go on to hamside.org and you actually submit your call sign and your latitude and longitude, that will help us to more accurately tie where your signals are coming from and going to. Okay. Another well, cool thing, one, one last thing. Um, there's another, a number of ways you can operate um, different types of skimmers. Um, things that report to PSK reporter or WhisperNet skimmers or, or things like that. So even if you just, if you don't want to actually operate the whole time, you can just run one of those and that will feed data into the whole system. And that's another great way of participating. Oh, okay. Yeah. And we even, there's even a contest, you have another contest called the Gladstone Signal Spotting Challenge, which awards points for people who are doing the listening. Oh. So, so you get, you get both of those. Oh, okay. There's a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so even if you don't want to jump in and be on the air, you can listen and still contribute. That's right. That's great. Well, yeah. I think uh, the advice of of just you know jump in and do it, just jump in and try it is uh, it's good advice not only for this event but for operating in general in general. So uh, I agree. Yeah, good advice. All right. Well, uh, thanks again to Dr. Nathaniel Fursell, W2NAF, for joining us today. And the On the Air podcast will be back in April 73. 73.